you've lived such a public life. You've done so many interviews. You've done a book. You've done a cookbook. You've been on TV. Is there anything you ever wanted to talk about that people just don't ask you about? Um, that's a, I mean, that's a great question. Um, no, not really. It, it's, I have like, especially now I have these like different facets of my life. There's the mom, there's the vintner, um, and then there's the athlete. And in some ways, you know, those lives intersect, but in many ways they're very, very different. So depending on what interview I'm doing, we're, we're focusing on one of those those um, parts of my life uh, when, you know, it it's all in one giant bucket and it's messy and complicated, but it's, you know, it's my life. <laughs> in what ways is it messy and complicated? Um, I have a problem. I say yes to a lot of things, um, you know, like that stupid, like Jim Carrey movie, like Yes Men. Like I have kind of lived my life in that way where I say yes to opportunities. And so I overschedule myself quite a bit. Um, and overcommit myself quite a bit. Um, but fortunately, I, um, I have a lot of redundancies with my calendar. So I mostly keep it on. I, I, I mostly uh, stay on top of it. But there are times I've failed miserably. <laughs> what do some of those failures look like? Oh, man, uh, I had I'm on the board. Well, I'm on. Yeah, I probably shouldn't say, but um, I'm on like various boards and I've had a meeting scheduled when at the same time I had an emergency with um, with my wine. And so I was stuck in our vineyard dealing with an issue when I should have been on a board call. Um, so and then, you know, coincidentally, there's never any service out in the vineyard. So, um, you know, just over scheduling and looking like an ass. <laughs> and then I flog myself for the next like two months. And, the, you know, um, because I'm very type A, um, I've always been a good student. I was, um, you know, I'm someone that is definitely the hardest on myself when I make those mistakes. So, um, yeah, I, I kick myself when I do those things. I'm so curious now, what does a wine emergency look like for a vent? Like what, ha what happens? <laughs> oh gosh. I don't, I don't even know. Um, lately if it's like, if I mess up on the website and then all of a sudden there, one day we had a glitch and it said our wine was like $0. So like, luckily no one placed an order then, <laughs> but I called my partner in a pure panic. Um, I wasn't sure what happened, but I fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard you talk about being a vintner in the wine business and a number of other spaces and places, but I'm curious, what did you have to learn that was new or different in order to move into that space? And of those things, which parts of it did you find to be the most challenging? I mean, I had to learn everything about it. I knew I loved drinking wine and I was a fan of wine, but I really didn't know anything about the business. Um, but I think because of athletics and my success in sport, um, that has given me such a sense of confidence. And um, I feel like I'm capable of, of learning uh, a lot of different things. Uh, I know I'm smart enough to handle it. It's just being willing to pivot when it's necessary and, you know, just, just learn as you go. But, um, I had to learn a lot. Like I learned the winemaking and I'm still learning the winemaking from my business partner, um, Shana Harding. She's the winemaker. She has all the formal viticulture and enology background, um, from UC Davis. I ended up taking um, some basic winemaking classes through Davis um, just to get my base knowledge. But fortunately, I went to Cal and because I was a psychology major, I had to have some biology and plant biology background. So I knew like the mechanisms of, you know, basic fermentation and things like that. Um, but winemaking, a lot of it is working as an apprentice, you know, and um, learning throughout the years. And I've learned quite a bit. But to go back to your initial question, like what appeals to me of winemaking is so many things. It's a combination of science and art. Um, there's like the physical labor part of it, um, where earlier this, um, this uh, vintage, so vintage 2022, 
um, Shana and I were, we are the entire business and we hand sorted all of our fruit. So that was, I think like 12 tons of fruit that the two of us are hand sorting. So there's um, the physical labor of, of literally, if you just go on our Instagram um, of us picking up the bins, dumping it onto a table, hand sorting it uh, of you know 20,000 pounds of, of fruit, doing that, moving bins, moving barrels. Um, so there's like that physical side that my athlete side loves. There's a science part that my brain loves. And then there's the artistic side of creating this beautiful product that you get to share with people and also marketing it and, you know, design help, like, you know, helping design what the bottle is going to look like. So it appeals to so many different parts of my brain. And um, it's a really unique business in that way. Of all the things that you could have done, what else did you consider for the next phase of your life, of your career before you moved in? I mean, wine being a very critical component of what you're doing now, but what else did you think about potentially doing? So many things <laughs> and not in like a flaky way, um, I, but I considered so many different things. Like when I went to school, um, when I went to Cal in the first place, I didn't, I never considered that I would swim another 16 years. Like when I came to Cal it was 2000 and I just had, I just missed um, making the Olympic team for the first time in 2000 and I had a horrible injury. I really hated swimming. Um, so I thought I was going to go to Cal, get my degree in probably biology. Um, and I thought I was going to become a physical therapist. Like I thought that's where my life path was going to, was going to go. And then just because I had um, physical therapists that were really important in my life as an athlete. And as a person, I always love physiology. Um, so that's kind of the path I saw myself going down and then, um, athletics happened and I went to my first Olympics and second and third, and I became this professional athlete. And so because of that, all these doors were opened up to me and I tried my hand in broadcasting at one point and, um, that was fun, but I didn't necessarily love it. But I also, but you know, something that, that I tried. Um, and then I started thinking, oh, maybe I will open a swim school, um, you know, learn to swim programs for little kids. It makes sense. My husband coaches swimming. I come from a swimming background. It, it makes uh, good sense. And and then I thought about maybe becoming a dietitian. <laughs> and I, I, there's just so many things that I really, really love to do and that interest me. Um, and because I was a professional athlete for so many years, you have to occupy your mind when you're not training. And so I, you know, intellectually pursued a lot of different things and learned about a lot of different things. And um, eventually my now business partner um, texted me in 2017 and asked if I wanted to partner with her on a wine. And I said yes before even thinking what that meant. And you know, here we are uh, on our sixth vintage um, and we have a beautiful brand or beautiful wine um, on a small brand that is growing every year. And you started swimming competitively when you were six years old, correct? Correct. And that was really the total focus of your entire life for a very long time. And you mentioned that you have an artistic dimension to your personality. That's part of what you enjoy with what you're doing with wine. It's such a young age being so focused on your sport. And I'm sure like everybody else, there's a lot of other stuff going on, but at the level at which you were doing it and the intensity with which you were doing it and the level of achievement that you were able to create as a young person, how did you nurture that artistic side of yourself or were you in touch with it or what was I that wasn't, like? I was, okay. I wasn't at all. Um, and I don't know if I would call myself an artistic person. Like there's like that part that like small, small, small part, part of me. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, as a kid, I was very, very focused. Like I was super competitive. Um, like that's when people ask, like, what do you think made you into the champion that you became? And I think the biggest piece of it was I was ultra competitive. And that was just something that I was born with. That was a personality trait or flaw or whatever you want to call it. Um, 
And I was able to channel that into swimming. Um, and I, cha- cha- you know, I challenged that into my academics as well. Um, and so between school and swimming, like those were my two major focuses from a young age. And as, you know, school got harder, swimming got harder and school got harder. And so I got, you know, acclimated to um, the demands of both as I, as I got older. Um, but yeah, I was pretty driven and pretty competitive from a young age. And with a competitive drive of that nature and magnitude, did you always have control of that or did it ever manifest itself in ways that maybe had consequences you would have preferred to have avoided? Yeah. I mean, socially, <laughs> it, socially, it, it could be hard being that competitive because you come off like such a jerk sometimes. Um, and it, you have a hard time letting things go. Like I remember in high school and or college, just playing ultimate Frisbee with my other super competitive friends. And you get in these stupid fights over a dumb Frisbee. (laughs) And, and so I learned at some point to like, Hey, tone down this competitiveness, um, when it really doesn't matter. And that was, um, a practice in self-control. Um, but but yeah, like there are times you get so competitive over the dumbest thing, a pool game. Like who cares if you're playing eight ball and you win or don't win? It's, I'm not, you know, I'm not a billiards player. <laughs> like who cares? And you talked a little bit about that transition and some of the different options you explored from a career point of view or what was next on the other side of swimming. How, how did you navigate what that was like from an identity point of view? Did you have to rediscover who you were after having self-identified as the world's best swimmer for such a long time? Or did you enjoy having a fresh start? Like after I stopped, after I stopped competing, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a very, very tough transition. Um, There are several transitions that athletes go through and that swimmers in particular go through. Um, So I remember as a kid, um, my first national team, I was 16, turned 17 at that major national um, trip. Um, It was Pan Pacific Games. It was in Australia at the pool where um, they were going to host the Olympics in 2000. And that was my first time really around um, the top, top swim team. Um, And I remember a few of the athletes talking about this post-Olympic depression and I had no idea what they're talking about. It made no sense to me. I'm like, why would you be depressed after you win a gold medal? It makes no sense. Um, and then, so there's there's that post-Olympic depression that a lot of people have gone through. And then in if you then go on to college, after your four years of college and the, those four years of el- eligibility, um, there's kind of the death of that college summer, right? Like after those four years are up, you're no longer a part of, of that Cal team anymore. You don't get to go to dual meets. You don't get to go to NC2As. Um, And so there's that transition. It's really exciting because then now you get to hopefully earn some money. Um, You know, the rules have changed since then you could earn money now, I guess, but um, you know, there, there's a transition, but um, you know, this, this college swimmer life of yours is now, now done. And then when your professional swimming career or athletic career is over, then what? So, um, yeah, there've been a bunch of transitions and I've been always aware that they were going to come up. Like I was never naive to the fact that I will stop swimming someday. I will not be a professional athlete forever. Um, so I always, kind of thought about what was next, how to set myself up for the future, both financially um, and um, just like emotionally, you know, just emotionally prepare yourself. But when I stopped swimming in, in 2016, it was really hard because I went from having uh, a very, very clear focus laid out for me, like from my coach and from my team and from my competition schedule. Um, and I went from being around, you know, 40 teammates all day, every day, joking, working our butts off, having so much fun 
to not being around those people every day. And that that's that's tough. And and I'm saying this as someone who is such an introvert. Um, like I I don't I, I I am an introvert at heart, but I do like to be around my friends and the people around me. And so that that was hard. Um, and you know, makes me yearn for those those days in the weight room where we're just you know trying to throw up like huge amounts of weight and be competitive with one another and joke around like that was so fun and i miss it terribly but um you know it doesn't last forever what kind of plan or infrastructure did you put in place to help ease the transition into civilian or post swimming life and what did it feel like to be back in the position which maybe you hadn't been in since you were six years old of being a total beginner at all of the things that you were now starting to do. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's such a hard thing, right? Um, you know, I did have the leg up of having the social media platform. Um, so when I did launch, um, Gadarian wines with my partner, um, you know, I had, a following that was curious of, of this new venture of mine and was supportive. So um, I did have a leg up in that way, but um, yeah, it's, it's hard starting anything new. And when you're starting in your thirties um, you're like, man, I'm a 30 something year old intern. But um, I think the way that people's career go now that that's more normal. Like if it was 20 years ago and someone's starting fresh in their thirties, you think of that, like, as like really brave or very, <laughs> are very different. Um, and now it's, it's, it's more commonplace that people start new careers, new paths, um, maybe later in life. And that is, um, more socially acceptable. Um, but what was your initial question? I started to answer it. Yeah, just as you started to kind of explore civilian life, you're trying out yeah. new different things. You're you're experiencing being a beginner, and for somebody who's so goal oriented, competitive, and to have achieved what you have achieved, to kind of be okay. What am I doing now? Does this feel good or not? Do I like these people or not? Is this the right career? Yeah, what, and, what did and, that and, feel like? Yeah, it was it was tough, but I I will say where I set myself up for success was um i made i was very frugal throughout my professional athletic career and i always you know saved and saved and saved and um like i started my you know set ira when i was 21 years old like i i, I set myself up knowing that i wasn't going to make this you know professional athlete money forever and keep in mind swimming professionally is not the same as nfl or nba or in some of these other sports so it's, it's smaller but um always having that focus like hey this is going to end i should save now gave me a lot of freedom and a lot of time to really explore what i wanted to do next without the pressure of having to get a job right away um so it gave me the freedom to start this brand with my, with a good friend and, um, be okay. Not making money the first few years. Uh, we weren't losing money, but we certainly weren't making a whole lot of money, but we're building the sweat equity in this lovely brand. And had I not set myself up in that way, um, through years of planning, I don't think I would have had the freedom and the time to explore this. What are the filters that you have used to determine who you spend time with, who you trust, and who you get involved with professionally? That's a good question. Um, my circle is pretty small. Um, I have, you know, a core group of very, very close friends and um, that have been my friends for a very, very long time. Um, you know, I've been with my now husband for many, many, many years, and he has a good compass and my family is all close to me. Um, so I have, you know, people that have been in my life for a very long time that I rely on. And um, I'm very loyal to my friends. And fortunately, they're, they're loyal as well. And you mentioned that you're an introverted person, and you've lived such an incredibly public life. And you know, I've spent 25 years working with and telling the stories of the world's top performers, brands, 
in businesses, as a journalist, as a communications executive, and in other capacities. And it's not always the case, particularly with athletes. There are a lot of athletes who have what it takes to perform at the very highest level. But then once they get there and they get all the stuff that comes with that, that a lot of people, I think, who are not in that position fantasize about or find to be highly motivating, that doesn't always feel good for everybody. How did it feel for you to have the level of success that you had and to have such a public life and to navigate that? It was it was hard at first. Um, and fortunately, social, me- social media did not exist when I first got my major success. Um, you know, my first Olympics was in 2004 and, you know, Facebook was created in 2005. So and, and still that was only available at like Harvard. Um, but, um, yeah, I was, it was tough because I remember go walking down the street in Manhattan and people recognizing me and just being confused as to how people were recognizing me and stopping me on the street. And like, like, yeah, that's kind of cool. But when you're a 22 year old, you know, female, sometimes that, that could be a little weird. Um, and so, yeah, it, it just, it was strange. And so I, I could empathize with some of these athletes who get so, so recognizable and famous and, you know, you tweet a picture or you put a picture on Instagram and people immediately know where you are. Like you have to be really street smart and you have to be savvy when you start to navigate that life. And, um, you know, now that I'm much older and a mother, um, I, I think about that for the next generation of you, you have to teach them these skills that no one had to, uh, learn. Um, but, but now it's, it's a necessity if, if you are going to utilize, you know, the public and the platforms that are, um, that are kind of thrust upon you. And as a mom with two kids, how do you approach or how do you think about your children and their relationship to sports now or in the future? And how do you present that to them and explore it? Yeah, no, it's really fun. So uh, my kids are very young. They're two and four, like just turned two, just turned four. Um, So obviously we put both of them in the pool immediately, Um, especially with my son, Ozzy, he's two um, we like lied about his, his age, um, to get him into swim school because it was the height of COVID and there was nothing to do. So, um, we said our three month old was six months and he was, he was huge. So it was fine. He passed. Um, but we got him into the pool really, really young, um, so that they learn water safety and just kind of develop a, a love for the water, you know? Um, so Last summer was the first time my daughter got experienced swim team, which was the cutest darn thing I've ever seen. She was three, you know, and she competed in three different meets and, you know, as a 25 free and a 25 back and it takes forever, but it's adorable. Um, So exposing her to swim team. um, And then we just um, added on a little bit of gymnastics and jujitsu and, um, my husband and I are kind of on the same page that we want to expose our kids to sports and we want them to find their own passions, but we also want to, we, we don't want to over schedule them so much that they're trying like seven different sports um, in that, like they just have these tiny little experiences, but they're not learning a whole lot. Like I've, I've, I've witnessed my daughter. She's been doing jujitsu now for, about two months and she's been going about three days a week for about two months. Um, and if she wasn't doing it that many times a week, she wouldn't be learning and she wouldn't be gaining this confidence. And I think the confidence and the fun of sports happens if you do it consistently. So, um, yeah, we're just trying all that is like to say that we're not trying to over schedule them. We're trying to expose them consistently to a few sports that they like and let them grow from there. Uh, the guest on the episode that I just dropped this week is Hector Beltran, who's a jujitsu black belt. He has an academy 
and down in California, and he was a bronze medalist at the Masters Nogi Worlds. How did you, um, jujitsu? You know, very popular right now. I mean, I would almost expect you to say that you also have your daughter bow hunting because that's another <laughs> big one right now. Maybe you, maybe you have an archery range in the backyard. <laughs> I just read Endor, so um, yeah, uh, about like bow hunting. Um, but yeah, um, no, we don't. Um, yeah, my my dad, he was his sport was martial arts, so he did kung fu his whole life um, as his sport, and he taught me um, when I was young, and we would spar all the time, and I always begged to do kung fu as well, um, but I always swam, and I think you know, I think my dad didn't really want his little girl to do, you know, Kung Fu. Um, so I was always so jealous of, of people who did martial arts. And so one of my daughter's best friends, um, was going to do martial arts and I was like, Oh, we're going to do this too. And, and I was thinking along the lines of karate or Kung Fu. Um, and, um, the mom and I, we were looking and we found this jujitsu and it makes so much sense so much more sense for a child to do jujitsu. I think it's not, you're not striking other kids. So you're not encouraging them to attack their, their brother, at least with like a kick or a punch. Um, and it's a lot more practical. Um, and I think there's, um, a lot of like innate features to wrestling other kids that I, I think is really good for a little kid. Um, but I love the discipline. I love that in her class, she's exposed to not only other four-year-olds, but there are eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds that um, she gets to, um, you know, aspire to be these older, cool kids. And these kids really take the little ones under their wing. It's just, it's such a nice class. That, and and that's, swimming is, is like that too. Like swimming is one of the few sports where the little kids are on the same team as the big kids. And so they get to aspire to be like the older kids and they're one team. Um, they're, they're not too many sports that do that. And um, so that's what appeals to me about jujitsu. But yeah, it's, it's hilarious watching four-year-olds try and wrestle and, and tap out and, 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 and how they actually understand what they're doing. It, it's kind of amazing. Uh, my kids are not in jujitsu currently. I have a four-year-old daughter and a six-year-old son. So it's spacing roughly the same as yours. And there is a lot of wrestling in my house. Uh, no jujitsu yet, but we have introduced both the verbal tap out and the physical tap out. <laughs> and it, it's actually like really up leveled their enjoyment of, of just goofing around because now everybody knows what the limit is and to actually stop at an appropriate time, right. which children don't always know. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. When they were first introducing arm bars, I'm like, oh God, I don't know about this. <laughs> but <laughs> but the kids get it. It's amazing. They get it. And what's your relationship to physicality, movement, sport like now? Yeah, it, that's evolved so much. Um, like after I stopped swimming competitively, I ran a ton and um, that was really my main outlet. And then after I had my daughter in 2018, I got horrible plantar fasciitis. Um, so I couldn't run like I used to. And so I started swimming, started doing a few things. Um, and it was like trying to stay fit, doing cardio in the gym, never really enjoyed that. Um, then got pregnant with my son. Like literally I found out I was pregnant and then the world shut down um, with COVID. And I will say I became like a veal. I did nothing. I was stuck in my house with a toddler. I was like huge. <laughs> my son was a very big boy. Um, and so I did not work out really at all during 2020, which was mentally and physically very tough on me. And then I ended up getting a rowing machine early 2021, which I am obsessed with. I love it. I still row a bunch to this day. And recently I started lifting, um, very, very heavy again and doing essentially the, the same workouts that I did when I was a professional athlete training for the Olympics. And, um, it's, inc it's incredible. My strength is the same that it, that it ever, ever was, if not better. Um, it's so fun. Like my body has adapted really well to it. Like this is what I need to be doing. Um, so it's evolved quite a bit in the last six months, but I lift really heavy, um, three days a week. I do some sort of cardio. I'm able to run again. My feet, um, are fine now. 
Um, I still row. I try to swim a little bit. And then I just took up rucking. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have I a just, go ruck? I have a go ruck. I have a go ruck. Um, yeah, I'm just, I just started. So I'm doing 30 pounds. Um, and I love it. I did it. I did this morning before my meeting. <laughs> That's great. I've had Jason McCarthy, the Green Beret founder of Gilruck on the show mm -hmm. twice. I ruck all the time as well. I'm actually looking out the window. I live in rural Maine. I can see Hatchet Mountain right out the window here. I often go ruck up and down Hatchet Mountain. And I now start my day every day. I go out with my ruck with my dog and I have high visibility stuff all over my ruck because I don't want to get Stephen King and get run over by a van on the side of the road. Exactly. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, what do you enjoy about rucking specifically? I literally just started, but I love uh, what appeals to me is the flexibility of it, um, of being able to pack a bag. Like if I am going on a work trip, for instance, taking this backpack, using it as my, um, as my carry on and then just throwing a bunch of weight in it wherever I am and then just going for a walk. I, I like the flexibility of being able to work out anywhere. Um, like that's like such the nice thing about running is you just put on a pair of shoes, you leave the house and you just go. Um, swimming is much more difficult in that. You have to find a pool, pool time, all this stuff, hair gets wet, all this. I, I like the simplicity of, of the ruck. Um, but I, and I always have had really strong legs and a strong core. So, um, I feel like I'm built to do it, um, in a lot of ways. I mean, I've been toting my kids around for the last four years right. and they're approximately 30 <laughs> plus pounds. So it's kind of perfect. It's a little bit more ergonomic, ergonomic than, uh, what I'm used to. <laughs> The one thing that I've found gets a bit tricky when we go on family hikes, which we do pretty regularly, is I'll wear my go rock. I'll often have 20 or 30 pounds in there. And my kids love to hike and they love to run on the trail. But especially with Ava, my daughter, it's changing as she gets older. But it used to be the case that, you know, we get 45 minutes into a two hour hike and it was, Dad, I need you to carry me. And then it's exactly, then I've got, <laughs> then I'm like, really got a serious load, which I don't mind going up the mountain, but coming down gets, gets yeah, a little tricky. bit intense. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I like, and I like that. Like you could go with people who aren't rucking and still get a really good workout. Like I, I like that flexibility. If I wanted to meet a friend at, you know, the local trail and, you know, he or she doesn't really want to get a workout in, I could put on some weight and it's, you know, it's a good, good, um, flexibility piece. How did rucking come into your sphere of consciousness? How'd you find out about it and how'd you get started? I think, I think I was listening to one of Peter Atia's like podcasts and, um, I think it was, oh, it was the comfort crisis. It was, I, I, was, I yes, I yeah. was, uh, I read his book, um, just a couple months ago and he started talking about it and, um, yeah, I was like, this sounds so great. And so my husband and I ordered one. My husband's been going like nonstop. Um, and, and he's actually going to do the 12 hour walk on Monday. Um, so we'll see how he goes with that. Not with a ruck, but, okay. um, <laughs> but, but yeah, we're, we're, we're into it. And when I hear you talk about cardio, when I hear people use that word, I feel like their relationship to it is like, ah, oh, I kind of, I kind of don't want to do this. Whereas with weightlifting, it sounds like you really enjoy going in and banging heavy weight. Is that the case? I, yes, I love it so much. Um, I squat pretty much every day because I'm really good at squat and I love it. Um, yeah, I, I still do what I used to do in training. So I superset everything as a swimmer. You use your body, you, you, you use your whole body all the time. So it's not unusual for me to do heavy squat, heavy pull-ups and alternate, um, several rounds. Um, I've been having a lot of fun, um, throwing up some really good weight, getting my pull-ups back, um, starting to do, uh, weighted pull-ups again. Like I, I really wasn't sure if I would ever be able to do pull-ups like I, I once did and it's coming back to me and it feels really, really good. Um, and it's just incredible how my body has responded to it. Cause you know, I've had two kids, I haven't been training like this in six, seven years. And, um, yeah, like the strength has come back. Like I was insanely sore those first few weeks, um, but I got through it and now I'm getting stronger every week. 
I just have this feeling that you may have set some goals for yourself in each of these lifts or <laughs> pull-ups. Is that the case? Yeah. I, I mean, I set a goal to be able to do 10 body weight pull-ups and I, I have been able to hit that again, um, which I was like, you know, that's pretty great. Um, but yeah, I want to, I want to be able to do pull-ups with 25 pounds, uh, or I, I used to do 35 pounds, um, for three pull-ups and not quite there yet, but, um, slowly, but surely getting there. In some of the podcasts that I was listening to when I was researching and getting ready for this interview, you addressed one of the questions that I had. So I already know the answer, but you used to swim up to 60 miles a week, I think. Yeah. Um, which is absurd. Like it, that sounds like hyperbolic, but, um, yeah, I, there were weeks in high school that we would do a hundred thousand meters, um, which is roughly 60 something miles. Um, you know, we did combination of meters and yards. So, um, but yeah, it, it was insane. Like no wonder I had shoulder problems. <laughs> um, and that's, it's not, that's not necessary. That's a very old school way of training. Like even Katie Ledecky, is not putting up that type of yardage. Um, so yeah, I used to do insane hours in the pool. And so the ability to focus is certainly there for me because, um, you're in your own head for hours and hours and hours of the day when you're swimming. I have a question about that specifically. This hadn't occurred to me, but was that super high volume methodology? Did that come from like the Eastern Bloc and migrate into the West or was, or did yes. Western? So that Definitely. was like athletes on tons of performance enhancing drugs in Eastern Europe were probably doing insane yardage that maybe the body, body's not built for. I, I think it was kind of that, that like Eastern Bloc mentality, um, performance enhancing or not. That's just, you know, that kind of like crazy strength and like toughness right. that is like just a part of their culture kind of seeped into a swimming culture and especially swimming American culture in the seventies and eighties. And so you have, you had, um, you know, fortunately it's getting replaced with the next generation, but for a very long time, you had all these little pockets of these old school programs where it was all about volume. And, um, like, I remember hearing this quote, it's like, we take a dozen eggs and throw them against the wall and the eggs that don't break are the great swimmers. Um, and it's really just, yeah, how much can you take and if your body can handle it and then you kind of like fall backwards into being the great swimmer because you survived this. Right. <laughs> it's um, training now for the most part. And, you know, there are pockets of this older school mentality that still exists. But but now training is much more performance oriented. It's training smarter. It's training so that we work with the physiology of the body Um a lot of swimming, if you're not doing the right technique, you will tear up your shoulders um, and neck and back. And um, so people have gotten a lot smarter and and also incorporated cross training to to supplement uh, swimming. Whereas before, you know, maybe you do some med ball throws and that was about it. Um, now swimmers do a ton of weights um, and Pilates and, and all sorts of cross training. And you've talked about when you were doing that insane yardage, as I, I believe that's the appropriate term of art, right? Yep, the, yep. Yeah. So when you were doing that, that super high volume, super high yardage, uh, I've heard you talk about how some athletes in swimming when they're younger, they really dissociate and they just, whatever, they, they daydream, they think about different stuff. But I've heard you talk about how you were focused the entire time on how can I get better with every stroke of every second of every minute that I'm in mm -hmm. the pool. And I'm curious on the other side of swimming now, like in your professional life, day to day as a mom, whatever, when you're lifting weights, whatever, do you still go deeply into your experiences and deeply into presence? Yes. And that's something that I, it took a very long time to get good at that. Um, and it was something that I just started to realize, like every kid in swimming, you sing a song and you like, like you said, you dissociate so you can get through this three hour grueling workout. And 
And that's a coping mechanism, but it's not necessarily helping you get better. So once I started getting more focused, I started getting better in each practice and then getting faster in my meets. And it just became this um, positive cycle where I got better in my meets, got better in training, training became easier. And those hours, like just, they, they went by a lot quicker when I was that, that focused. And so that's something that I practiced for years and years and years and years and got really good at that, where I could stay highly, highly focused for many hours. And, and now it's, it's funny. It's one of the things my husband kind of complains about um, sometimes with it's I'll get very, very focused on a project and I'll have zero idea how much time went by um, where it's like, Oh, I'm, I just need to work on this one thing and it'll take me five minutes. And then an hour and a half later, I'm still working on it and time kind of disappeared. So um, I have to set my timer a lot of times um, just to keep myself on task. Um, but yeah, I, I get focused, very, very focused on certain things, which I think is making me sound kind of ADD. But um, yeah, I, I get very, very um, focused on the task at hand to the point where I just lose sense of time sometimes. It sounds to me like you're entering a flow state and you're able to do it with a variety of activities because you've refined your capacity to be present and to be in this mental state from swimming. Yeah. And it's just, it's so funny because as I learned more about, um, uh, meditation, uh, as I got older, I was like, Oh, that's kind of what I'm doing. You know, I'm doing this, um, exercise meditation and training and, uh, I, I know a lot of people have such a difficulty staying present in, in meditation and, you know, I do as well, but, um, it, once I started learning about meditation, I was like, oh, that's what I've been trying to work on for so long. And it makes sense. And, and now I could apply this to things outside of swimming. What in your life do you want to be doing that you're not currently doing? that you're struggling to make happen or to do? So many things. I want to golf. <laughs> I really want to golf. Um, I want, like, I want to have something competitive and athletic that I could do from, for many years. And I was, I was realizing I, I got, I get invited to all these like golf tournaments all the time and I love doing it, but I never practice. And so obviously I'm not going to get better unless I practice. Um, so I need to find some friends that will actually go golfing with me. Um, cause that's not a solo sport. Um, so that's one of the things, um, I want to learn piano. I moved into a new house, um, a year ago and the former owners just left their piano. So I've been that's learning. Nice. It's, it was amazing. Yeah, like, and, cool. and actually, yeah. And I got it tuned and the guy's like, it's actually in pretty good shape. Like I thought it was a piece of junk, um, but it's, it's in decent shape. Um, so I've been learning online, um, uh, and there's like some great programs online. So I've been doing that. Um, those are kind of like the goals that, you know, I could do for the rest of my life. Those are two things that you could do well into, <laughs> into old age. Um, and I mean, yeah, I've been like toying with the idea of doing jujitsu myself, but I don't know if I really want to wrestle a bunch of strangers, so we'll see. <laughs> I might, I might try it. Um, I, I get so jealous watching my daughter. I'm like, oh, that looks so much fun. And then I was telling one of my best friends about it, and she's like, "Do you really want to wrestle strangers?" I was like, "No, not really." <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, I've, I've never thought about it that way before. That's funny though. Yeah, she 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 knows me very well, and I was like, "Oh yeah, good point." I don't know if I would like this after all. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. To loop back on the piano thing for a second, my kids go to to music class. We have instruments all over the house. I wouldn't say that I'm particularly good at playing music, but I've always really enjoyed it. Has music always been a part of your life? Have you ever have you like goofed around with instruments throughout your life or is this a new thing? Yeah. Um, so my mother's side of the family is Filipino and, um, Filipino culture, like music and singing and playing instruments is such a big, big piece of that. Um, my grandma has got a million different brothers and sisters and they all play so many different instruments. Like my grandma plays the baritone ukulele. She plays the banjo. She plays the guitar. She could play the piano. She could sing. Um, 
and all my relatives have been like that. Um, so yes, like I did choir, um, in, in middle school and I went to a Catholic school in Vallejo where again, the kids in my class, they were all first generation Filipino American, like 95% of them. Um, so singing was always a big piece of, um, something that I wanted to do. I'm not a good singer. I love singing. I'm not a good singer though. Um, but yeah, like, so I always like would play on the piano. Um, I never formally learned, um, my parents when I was, I think maybe 10 bought me this thing called the miracle. I, I don't know if you ever heard about it is it like Sounds cool. this, this keyboard that hooked up to your computer and the, and keep in mind, this is like a computer in the early nineties. Um, and you would play duck hunt by like, you know, um, by playing the proper keys. And, um, it's funny cause I still have this keyboard and it still works. I let my daughter play with it until we got our real piano. Um, but I, I always wanted to learn, um, but I never had time with swimming. Um, and so now that I have this gorgeous piano just sitting there, I could force myself to at least practice 10, 15 minutes a day. Um, and again, some days it's a couple hours and some days it's really five to 10 minutes. And when you were in the choir in middle school, I also grew up Catholic. I went to Catholic school through until college, actually. Um, did Same. you sing? <laughs> Were you say was Eagles Wings in the repertoire in the choir? <laughs> um, were the like Bette Midler or is it? What, no, it's not a Bette Midler song. Oh, it's just oh, like oh, it's oh. like a big. It's tough to go to a mass and not hear Eagles Wings or a Catholic funeral. It's like I don't know. Maybe no. maybe, maybe that's a East Coast thing. I don't know that one. Okay. Or maybe right. I do, and I'm just I never called it that. I do remember like learning all the signs for a lot of um, different songs and it was, it was fun, but, uh, but yeah, I wasn't the best singer. And when you sit down to play the piano, do you goof around and jam or is it always directed practice? It's a little bit of both. So I will like warm up with my scales in the beginning, work on, um, some drills, work on a song and then, um, the, the program that I follow is um, Pianote. It's an online um, uh, tutorial and it's like lessons um, and you just progress as you get better. And um, they encourage uh, improvisation at the very end of every practice. And um, so I try to, I sometimes do it, sometimes don't. That's not really, um, I'm, I'm someone who likes to just work at something, but I, I do try and play um, as much as I can. That's one of the things that I personally have really enjoyed about being a parent is getting to see, I, I mean, results may vary. It's probably different for everybody, but at least with my kids, it's been really powerful for me to see from when things started out, like every kid's an athlete, every kid is an artist, every kid sings, every kid dances. And then over time, I think people get feedback or get made fun of or whatever. And th those things start to get pushed down and down and down. And then people have a different sense of who they are from where they started out. But with my son, for example, he really enjoys playing things that he's learned how to play. He's learned how to read music now. And like, he'll I actually... I've tried to get him to go in the other direction of like, Hey man, like let's just jam. Music can be just goofing around on this keyboard or the guitar or whatever. I've showed him a few things and then he'll like notate it and come up to me and be like, dad, here's the music. I'm like, are you, such a good student. <laughs> yeah, you, know, it's like, you must have, you know, that must be your mom's side of the family. Cause you definitely didn't get that from me. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's part of what I love about music is just goofing around and improvising. And do you all play as a family at all? No, my, it, it's funny. My daughter, she doesn't, she ha doesn't seem to have any interest in music, which is really funny because my mom and grand and grandma and uh, my mom's sister throughout COVID, they um, learned the, well, my mom and sister learned the ukulele and my grandma would play with them uh, via zoom and they did it for like a year and a half without missing a single day. Um, and my daughter was present for a lot of that. And so she learned, she learned so many really old songs, like stuff from like Burl Ives and like 
Tiny Bubbles is one of her favorite song or like Elvira, like all these really, really old songs. And I'm like, I don't even know what these are. Um, so she has a pretty eclectic taste, but she, she doesn't really seem drawn to music the same. Um, but my son, my son does does seem a lot more drawn to music. Like he plays on the piano, he dances a lot when he hears uh, music. So I think the music um, side is like much more in my son than it is my daughter, which is funny because she's been exposed to more music. <laughs> hey, they're all different, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, are you still in the chicken game? I am not, sadly. When we moved last year, um, we... Um, so I had my last house, we were there 15 years, had this ridiculous, beautiful edible garden and we had 11 chickens and, um, especially throughout the pandemic, like that was fantastic. Um, I grew a lot of food, um, and had tons of eggs. Um, and when we sold the house, the people who bought it actually kept the chickens as well and they're alive and well, and I kind of showed them how to take care of them and, um, they're, they're doing a great job with them and our new house, I, I, we just completed our edible garden. Um, but it doesn't really have room for chickens, sadly. What's going down in the edible garden. What have we got out there right now? Um, we have, uh, three citrus. So we have a Moro blood orange, a bear's lime, a Meyer lemon. We have a bunch of, um, fajoyas like pineapple guava that grows really, really well here. Um, and it's one of the few things that's very deer tolerant, um, cause we do have quite a few deer, um, we have a pear tree, tons of, um, greens, like a lot of salad greens and braising greens and herbs. Um, and yeah, the fig, oh yeah, we have a fig as well. And then our stone fruit, we're going to do a whole like orchard of stone fruit as well. Strong. Yeah, it's strong. Um, yeah, my, my old stone fruit orchard would put out like a hundred pounds of fruit and I'd make so much jam and preserves and eat just tons of, of plums throughout the summer. Um, so I'm looking forward to that, uh, the next few years. What do you get out of your relationship with your garden? I, well, first of all, you get the best quality stuff that you could, um, that you, like, you can't buy some of this stuff. Like if you, like those little like fuez and forgive my French, like the fuez du bois, like the little alpine berries, you can't buy those at the store because they're too delicate, but they are the most perfumey, um, intense strawberry you'll ever have. Um, you save a lot of money when you're, you're growing your own herbs. Like you plant a few things of thyme and it'll come back and stay there. At least in California, it stays there year after year, it grows and grows and grows. So you do it once. Um, so there's just something that's just so nice about going out into the yard, picking your salad, picking your herbs, picking some fruit and knowing that's there. And for the, for my kids, I think it's really important um, for them to know where their food comes from. Um, like that's something I really miss not having the chickens um, anymore. Like I really enjoyed having my daughter help me with the chickens and helping me catch the chickens when you needed to, and then uh, collect their eggs and, um, and also, I mean, with their immune systems, it's so good for them to be around farm animals like that. Um, so I, I do miss that. Um, but yeah, just being in touch with the soil, um, it does things to your brain. Like, I mean, that's, it's proven in science. Like it's really good for you, for you to get down, um, in your hands in the soil and, um, yeah, and just know where your food, your food comes from. When we lived in Oakland before we moved to Maine, we had an orange tree in our backyard that had, I mean, the oranges were so good. Yeah, it's just so ever. nice. Yeah, but, and there's just something so nice about that. Yeah, and uh, like right now I'm looking out and I can see my chicken coop. My chickens probably wish they lived in California, I would guess. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but, <laughs> happy chickens live in California. <laughs> yeah, but, but they're, uh, they're happy chickens. It's, you know, we kind of had a blizzard overnight slash today, but they're still out. They're running around. I was asking my son before I did this interview, I was confirming what varieties we have. He said, dad, there are too many for me to name right now, but we do have some Dominiques. We have some Phantoms and it is fun. It's fun to go out and you know, feed and water them, collect the eggs, watch them run around. And, you know, we've had some valuable lessons 
Natalie about the circle of life because oh, we, of course, yeah. we have foxes, we have all kinds of animals, and they're uh, they're hungry. Those animals, <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, they, and they like to eat chickens. Yes, so. I, I lost one to a raccoon once. Um, that was in my coop. Like it, oh, like this yeah. stupid this stupid chicken stuck its head out of the coop, and then this raccoon like ripped its head off. Uh, it was like the worst discovery uh, <laughs> one morning. Uh, but we, it happens. Yeah, it has. We, we've actually we had an incident with a raccoon recently. I don't know what the I don't know all the coop terminology, but we have a kind of a big coop, and the chickens have a ladder that they sleep on. Mm -hmm. And we went in there and there was a raccoon in there and, you know, they had all gone to like the highest rungs. We got the raccoon out. So listeners rest assured there were no fatalities during that incident. It tends to be more during the season when foxes have babies. That's typically when we start to see attacks. And it's wild because I go out there typically at night to shut the coop down. I take out, you know, my flashlight. You look over and there's like these little eyes out in the yeah. field just waiting for the the moment to attack but yeah they they do they get so fixated it's it's truly amazing to watch um so i miss i miss having that and um but it was it was so nice to get those like beautifully col colored eggs the best tasting eggs you'll ever have giving all the kitchen scraps to the chickens was so nice the manure that they would give us for a compost like it's just i loved that like closed loop um that we had and it was a good learning experience for my daughter. So I'll just have to educate my son in a different way. There might be chickens in your future. Who knows? But I don't think in this house, I think my neighbors wouldn't uh, approve. <laughs> <laughs> we're much closer to our neighbors than yeah. we were previously. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get it. Uh, I kind of asked you this before we started rolling today, but is there anything that you've always wanted to be asked about that no one ever asked you about? Um. Yeah, I mean, probably not. I don't know. Like I, like I said, it's usually focused on one area um, of my life. Like in this interview, we did we focused on a little bit of everything, which has been great. Um, yeah, like there's, I've been asked a lot of different things, and I don't, I don't know. Um, but that's a good question. <laughs> it's well, this is like the combo platter of interviews, then. So that's I love that's, it. That's good to hear. So Natalie, if people want to learn more about you, follow you, check out your wines, where should they go? Yeah. So just Natalie Coglin um, on Instagram and Gadarian Wines on Instagram. Gadarian Wines is G-A-D-E-R-I-A-N-S. All right. Hey, or, sorry, let me start over. Gadarian Wines, G-A-D-E-R-I-A-N and then Wines. Um, so, um, yeah, on Instagram, I'm very, um, well, I wouldn't say very active. I'm active on Instagram on both those platforms. Um, and then there's a link tree with both of them, um, for cookbooks, for, um, podcasts such as this one, um, for, for everything. Awesome. Natalie, thanks so much for joining me today and for what you shared. And I wish you luck with the wines and with hitting new PRs in all of your lifts. Thank you. Thank you. It's been really, really fun. Um, been really fun getting back at it and pretending like I'm a professional athlete again. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Natalie.